So does anyone else ever feel like this is what your prayer life is like? You ask for one thing, you get something else. You put one thing in, you get something different out than you were really intending. Uh, We started a new series last week entitled Waiting on God, and we're sort of wrestling with this universal frustration that all of us have. If you're a Christian, you certainly have this. Even if you're not a Christian, but you believe there's a God, you've experienced this. And maybe if you're not even sure about God, but you have rough patches in your life from time to time, and so you just start lobbing prayers up into the sky to whom it may concern, you know? Um, And no matter what your religious persuasion, no matter what you believe, there have been or there will be times in your life where you feel as though God is inattentive, uncooperative, or late. In fact, last week we asked the question, I asked you to, to raise your hand if you've ever felt this way, if you've ever felt like for any reason at any season in time that God for you has seemed to be inattentive uncooperative, or late. And pretty much everybody raised their hands, right? We, we, we're all in this boat. And one of the things that's so frustrating when we're in a season like this, when we're in a season uh, of begging God, you know, it's like, God, please, please, I, I just need an interview. I, I've been trying to find work, and I don't even have an interview. Just, just give me an interview. Or maybe it's, God, can I have a date? I'm not looking for a spouse or to be married. A date, would be nice. That's all I'm asking for, God. I'm I'm not asking for too much. Maybe maybe it's insurance. God, I need insurance. Or or maybe it's a son or daughter we've been asking for God to to bring home or or marriage that needs to be healed. And one of the frustrating things that we experience in times like this is when we look around and we see others who things seem to be going well for, right? Right? And we talked about this last week. We may be better people than them, right? They may not even be good people, but they seem to have good things continually happen to them and in their lives. And it makes makes no sense to us. They may not even believe in God. They may not pray. It seems like they don't even have to ask. And things just work for them. Life just works. It seems to happen magically for them. And, and here we find ourselves, we're, we're just begging God. And we're not asking for a new car. We just want reliable transportation, right? We're not asking to get rich. We just want any job at all. And, and if God were actually there, it would seem like he would answer a prayer like this, right? I mean, if he was really there, if he was really God, he would answer my prayers, And and it's not just for a day or for a week. For many of us, it seems like it's seasons of life that we get trapped in these moments where God seems inattentive, uncooperative, or or late. And so we have relationships where there's no progress. A a prodigal son or daughter that's nowhere to be seen. Maybe a, a health issue for you or someone you love. And if there was a God, why wouldn't he answer this prayer? I'm not asking too much. I just want to get to average, right? I, I just want to, I want to get to the normal part. I want God to do for me the things he seems to do for everyone else. And so why would God be inattentive, uncooperative, or late for me in this? And, and it's not just about the nature of God that we start to wonder about or, or, or um, his character or does he love me. But if this continues on for very long, if we live life in this season for, for long enough, uh, we don't just wonder these things. We begin to wonder if there's really a God at all, right? We, we start to think, does he really exist? Even though it's completely irrational, it doesn't make sense. After a while, we feel that if he doesn't care... If he's not answering my prayer, can 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 really um, can he can he even exist? It can lead us to this place of thinking this over and over and over again. And so, after all, if he were there and he did love me, he would certainly answer my prayers. And so we start to question again the very existence of God. So because this is so real, because so many of us experience this wondering if God is really there. Um, I want to make a statement 
um, that I think is going to be helpful for us. Because here's the deal. If we can't get over this hurdle, if God has sort of seemed not to be there for you and your prayers just sort of don't get beyond the ceiling, and you just, to be honest, I mean, you come to church, maybe this is kind of what you do, but you're really not sure he even exists. If you're wrestling with this hurdle, you may not hear what we have to say what we, when we get to the text today. Um, you may not hear what we say next week. And so I want to make a statement that I, that I think is going to help. And here's the statement, very simply. God's lack of cooperation is not an argument for or against his existence. Can I say that again? God's lack of cooperation is not an argument for or against his existence. This is a big deal. Because emotionally, doesn't this feel like an argument? Well, if God doesn't cooperate, if he never cooperates, then, then maybe he doesn't exist. Because of how I feel, God, it seems like it's been so long. It seems like you're inattentive, and it's easy emotionally to make the leap to the place where you think he doesn't exist, even though, again, it's not rational. There's no correlation between if God cooperates with you in his existence. So, so if, if a lack of cooperation was proof that someone did or didn't exist, a lot of times I would wonder if my son Christopher existed. Right? Can parents say amen to that? Like, you know, it's like if, if our kids... Uh, didn't cooperate, if that, was, if that was proof of a lack of existence, would our kids exist? Oh, or there would be times, if this was true, that my son Christopher, eight years old, um, would walk around the house and he would say things like, there is no dad. There is no dad. I don't believe in dad. Right? Because hopefully as parents, we don't say yes and cooperate and give in to every single thing our kids ask, Right? Now, if you do, please don't say yes or raise your hand because that's not good. So, 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 so why is this? Because, because God's not cooperating with me, and so, so that messes with us. So you see, cooperation doesn't prove that something does or doesn't exist. But, but let's just be honest. Isn't it true that we're, when we're in the middle of a season where God seems silent or absent, it's easy to assume that he must not be there or may not exist? Maybe you grew up in a church or a religious upbringing that taught you if you just had enough faith, then God's going to answer your prayers, right? If you just believe enough or believe in the right ways, then God will show up. So you kind of feel put upon that, that there's something wrong with you, that there's something wrong with your faith. Maybe you grew up in a church where, where if you just give more, God will honor and bless you. If you just serve more, God will honor and bless you. Maybe, maybe if it's there's sin in your life, right? Now God's not going to listen to you at all. And so we, we wind up in these seasons of life where we keep looking in the mirror and we ask ourselves this question, God, what is wrong with me? What do I need to do differently? What, what have I messed up? And I think one of the reasons I wanted us to do this series, Pastor Jeff had the idea for the series um, was because especially coming out of a series on money and then a series on relationships. And I tell you what, if there's going to be things we all struggle with, isn't that, I mean, anyone ever feel kind of constricted financially, right? And then anyone ever feel like relationships are hard, you know? And so we talk about those things, and it's really easy to, to understand why it feels like we can be waiting on God, and so um, the reason we wanted to do this is that, that I want you to see how in the Bible it's full of people. It's full of people that God loved. He knew them by name. And yet if we dropped in to certain situations or periods of time in their lives, we would assume about them the same things we assume about ourselves. That God for them was inattentive, uncooperative, or late. So I thought it was important that we create a new category, a new category to sort of think about all of this for some of us. To know that you can go through seasons of your life where God does not seem to be there and know that it's not a reflection of how God feels about you. It's not a reflection of your faith and it's not a reflection of your obedience. People that God absolutely loved, people who God knew their name, went through times and seasons where God was inattentive uncooperative or late. Last week we talked about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the guy who came to announce Jesus, was faithful to everything God asked him to do. He was actually Jesus' cousin, and yet he winds up in prison. 
rotting away in prison. Jesus doesn't bust him out. And, and he stays there for so long that eventually he's decapitated. And God seems totally inattentive to this guy who did nothing but serve God with his life. And today we're going to talk about someone, if you grew up in the church, you certainly heard this guy's name. Even if you didn't grow up in the church, this is a, a pretty popular person. Um, so you probably heard his name, but you may not know the full extent of his story. And when we meet him in the New Testament, his name is Saul. But we, we kind of know him as what? You guys are on it today. Nice. So, so we know him as Paul, and here's the guy that God uses to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and, and he takes it to the world. He takes it beyond Jerusalem and Judea I into the rest of the world. So he takes the gospel around the world. And Paul spends 20 years, 20 years. I mean, who does the same job for 20 years anymore, right? 20 years of his adult life, he spends traveling around the Mediterranean Rim and going into very hostile areas to tell people the good news of Jesus, to share with them that, that God has done something unique and new and that he sent Jesus to die for the sins of mankind. And Paul, uh, on his journeys, he was shipwrecked, he was beat up, he was stoned, he was put in prison, he was snake bit, he was almost drowned. Every day for Paul was an adventure. Clearly, God knew his name. He, he called him to this very important work, this, this specific task. God did miracles through the Apostle Paul. And for 20 years of his life, he did nothing but faithfully serve God. Now, Paul became a Christ follower about three to four years after the resurrection. Um, and, and up until the point where he accepted Jesus as Lord, um, his whole job was to snuff out Christianity. He thought that it was sort of this, this upstart or this fake religion, this fake false Judaism. And so he wanted to totally eliminate it. So he persecuted the church. He persecuted Christians. He killed Christians. And then Paul, this guy, encounters Jesus. And it totally changed his life. When, when he becomes a follower of Christ, he, he went all in and was all out for Jesus, he spends a few years training uh, to do this work. Um, he spent some time with Peter, who was the head of the church in the very beginning. Uh, and he spent some time with James, the brother of Jesus. And then again, for 20 years, he launches out and he takes the gospel to places it had never been before. And soon after uh, he becomes a Christ follower, he's afflicted with some kind of physical issue, some kind of ailment. And it's such a big deal, it's become such an impediment or an obstacle that it's hard for him to even continue doing the work that God has called him to do. So when the Apostle Paul realized this, when, when this thing continued to, to flare up in his life, and we're not even sure what it is, but, but it was such a big deal that he did exactly what you would do and exactly what I would do if we had, you know, I mean, if you're working for God, you're, you're, you're living your life for God, you're doing everything you do for God, and there's this thing that comes along that's keeping you from doing that, um, he did what we would do. He said, God, will you take this from me? God, will, will you help me from this? Will you remove this from my life? And God told him, no, no, no. And and I don't care how much faith you have, Paul. I don't care how long you pray. I don't care how obedient you are. I don't care how long you fast. I don't care what you promise or how you bargain. The answer is no. The answer to this one, Paul, someone who I love, whose name I know, who I've called. Paul, Paul you're going to be so famous, people are going to name their kids after you. Paul, you're so famous that, that one of the greatest buildings ever erected in the history of the world is going to be done so in honor of you. And even given all of this, the answer is no. The Apostle Paul wrote letters to the churches that he went out and started. He'd, he'd tell people about Jesus. People would ex come to faith and they would start churches. And so, so he'd write all these letters. And these letters make up more than half of our New Testament. 
So the guy that wrote what we find in more than half of the New Testament in our Bibles, God says to him, no, 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 no. We could stop the message right here, couldn't we? I mean, for some of us, this should be unbelievably encouraging because we think that God doesn't exist. We, we think that he doesn't know our name and that he doesn't care, that, that he really doesn't, exi- he doesn't know we exist. And what I want you to know is that this one person who God used more than anyone other than Jesus, God said to him, no. But in response to this request, As a replacement, God offered him something else that I believe, based on the scriptures and my experience, he offers to you and to me this very day. And so we're going to drop in to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in a second. We're going to drop in sort of the the middle of a verse in verse 7. But but let me say this. If you have your Bibles and want to turn there, that's great. If not, we'll have the text on the screen. The thing you need to know, this, this is a letter that Paul wrote to Christians in Corinth. Uh, He started this church there, and so he's writing this letter, and he's telling them about his experiences, about his his story. And he shares with them that all the things God has revealed to him are just so incredible that he gets to share with everyone else. They're just so amazing. And the things that God has allowed him to do are so great that God gives him this, this issue, this problem, as a way to keep him humble. So God allows him to experience this affliction. And in describing the story, he gives us an insight of what we can expect when God says no. So check it out. Here's what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 7b. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, I want to stop here for just a second. Some of you have been using this term for a long time, right? Maybe you refer to an ex, thorn in my flesh, right? Maybe it's a boss or a coworker or a friend or a neighbor, whoever it might be. You didn't know that you were using a biblical term. So next time you're talking about those thorns in your flesh, you can actually feel good that you're being biblical, right? This is good. This is where this idea came from. And so then he continues on, this thorn in in his flesh, he calls it a messenger of Satan. Now, we don't exactly know if this is a literal thing or a figurative thing. For example, have you guys ever done this? You know, you you have a really rough week, a lot of stuff happens, and you're like, man, that was the week from hell, right? Right? Or you go on a vacation and you get there and like every night there's like huge problems with your hotel rooms and stuff breaks down and just doesn't work and you miss things and, and you're like, that was the vacation from hell, right? And so, so we don't know if, if this thorn in Paul's flesh, this messenger of Satan, if he's saying that like it's, like it's a, a literal thing or a figurative thing, but a lot of times we just sort of mean this experience is hellish, Right? It's, it's less than I want it to be. And then what does he say about that? The thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan. What does it do? It was sent to torment him. So this ailment or this malady was so bad that it, it tormented Paul. It wasn't just something he had to put up with. It says it tormented him all the time. Every single time he got on or off a ship. Every time he wrote a letter. Every time he got up to speak in his work for the Lord, this was a constant torment. Some people think it might have been epilepsy. So Paul never knew when he was going to have a seizure. And so there'd be times maybe where he was going to do something, he'd wake up on the floor because he'd had a seizure. Now, at at this point in time in history, uh, people saw epilepsy as demon possession. Can you imagine if your job was to tell people about Jesus and then you're doing the thing that everyone thinks is demon possession? That sort of counteracts what you're supposed to do, right? Right? Other people think that it was ongoing bouts with malaria. He kept having to to fight malaria. Some people think it had something to do with his eyes. We know from other sources that the Apostle Paul had terrible eyesight. We really don't know exactly what it was, but what we do know is that it was constant torment to him, and it got in the way of everything he was trying to do, his his ministry for the Lord. So, So imagine this. Here is the guy who was specifically called to do the most important thing that anyone did in his generation. 
And at the end of the day, he was really successful, wasn't he? I mean, he did a lot of great things. And so he says, God, all I'm asking you to do is the stuff I've seen you do for other people. You know, just heal me. I've watched you heal dozens and hundreds of people. And, and God, you, you've used me to, to do this. So the thing you've used me to do for others, God, I just want you to do this one thing for me so that I can continue in my work for you so I can be more effective for you. Just heal me. And then he says this, watch this. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. This doesn't mean I talked to God for a second on Monday afternoon and then I talked to him again for a second on Tuesday afternoon. I skipped Wednesday. We talked about it one more time Thursday and then I'm like, ah, heck, God's not going to answer this one. No, 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 no. This, this idea of, of pleading, um, these are seasons of prayer probably occurring when things got really bad when this issue flared up. Um, when it felt like he wasn't going to be able to continue on. And, and these three different times of pleading probably happened at different points throughout the 20 years where he served God. Maybe it was days and nights that he spent. Maybe he fasted and prayed. We don't really know. But, but this was more than an ask. It was more than just a request. Paul here is just taking it to God. He's pleading with God to remove this. Now, can you think about... The, the bargaining power the Apostle Paul would have had. You know, if he was like trying, God, look at all the stuff you've used me to do. Like, he had, uh, do you ever try to bargain with God? Now, now some of you, maybe you're, you're here today and you have a, a thing you need God to do. You're asking him to do. You're waiting for him to do in your life. So maybe for you, it's like this, God, okay, okay, you know what? I'll even stick around after church today and go to New to New Hope if you just do this one thing for me, Right? I'll, I'll, listen, I'll listen to that guy talk even more. Just do this one thing for me. Oh, or, or maybe you're like, you know what? I, I, I've never come to Ash Wednesday, but I'll even come to Ash Wednesday this Wednesday to kick off Lent. Heck, God, if you do this thing for me, I'll even maybe give something up for Lent for those 40 days. If you, God, if you just show up in my life. God, if you can just answer this, this one request for me, I'll come to all three Easter services. I'll come to the early one, the middle one, and the late one. Just do this, this one thing for me. God, I'll give more. I'll serve more. Uh, I, I'll never, ever take a drink again. I'll never, I'll never, I'll always, I promise. You know how you bargain with God. You know what you say. So imagine how the Apostle Paul could do this and the leverage he would have had. And the scripture says he pleaded with God. He sort of did this three times. Again, if we just stopped right here, I, I don't know about you. Maybe it's just me. This is encouraging, isn't it? Here is someone who God loved. He knew him by name, um, and, and he called him to do some of the most amazing and significant things that have ever taken place. And in spite of all this, God says, no. So he goes on to say this. But he said to me, okay, we've got to stop right here. I'm going to be transparent. Isn't this where Paul sort of goes light years ahead of us? Here's what I mean by this. For, for many of us, I think you'd agree with this, um, we would just like to hear something from God, right? Even no would be encouraging. It'd be better than the silence, right? It'd be better than, than nothing that we, we hear. But, but um, no at least means that you are alive, that God has heard your prayer. He knows you're in trouble. He knows what you need. Anything's better and more encouraging than nothing, so one of the problems for us is that, that we pray and pray and ask and ask and bargain and bargain and manipulate and promise. And we do all the things we feel like we're supposed to do, yet we hear nothing. At least in Paul's case, there's a response. He got an answer. And even though you may not get an actual answer like the Apostle Paul, I know with certainty that his answer can be your answer today. The answer God gave him is the answer that God is giving you. How do I know? Well, it's not just the scriptures. It's not just my own experience. It's because in the last 20 years in ministry as a pastor, I've seen dozens and maybe even hundreds of people who can identify in their lives with what God promised Paul. What, what he experienced, they've experienced. And so so here's, here's what it is. But he said to me, what did he say to Paul? My grace 
is sufficient for you. Paul, the answer to your prayer is no, but my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, I'm not going to give you what you're asking for, but my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, I'm not going to give you what you think you need when you think you need it, but my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, you're going to have to go a whole other season without. You're going to have to continue to deal with this. But my grace is sufficient for you. Grace in this context is simply the ability to, to continue to put one foot in front of the other. It, it's all it is. It's, it's, the grace is the ability to get up and make it through one more day. Grace is the ability to go to work and endure it just one more time. Grace is the ability to come home to the unknown one more afternoon. Grace is the ability to keep on going. In spite of the fact that nothing around you has changed, to find the energy, to find the strength, and to find the faith to keep moving in the direction that God would have you move. So God says to the Apostle Paul, who he loved, no, I'm not going to remove this physical problem, but I'm going to give you what you need to keep moving forward with it. So even though I'm not taking it away, I'm going to give you everything you need to survive this, to succeed and even thrive in the middle of this. My grace is sufficient. Sufficient means adequate. It means more than enough. For you, God's grace is more than enough, more than what you need. And then look at the next statement. For my power is made perfect. Perfect means mature. It means to come to full fruition. It is, it is totally exploited. My power is made perfect in weakness. None of, none of us would sign up for this version of this, would we? It's like, hey, God, guess what? I'm really weak in a whole bunch of ways, so this is good news for your power, right? See, we want to be the guy, don't we, in the end zone who's caught the football, has scored the touchdown, maybe who's won the game, and we, what do we do? We take that finger and we're like, we give God the glory. Or we want to be the guy who gets to trot slowly around third base because we have hit that ball out of the park, Right? And, 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 and so we're heading to home plate. We're going to celebrate with our teammates. And we fire that finger up in the air. We're going to give God all the glory. We, we love doing that. We love giving God the glory. But we don't want God to leverage his glory out of our weakness. We want him to leverage his glory out of our talent, out of our ability, out of our opportunity, out of our strength. We want to get the salesman of the year award, don't we? And we're in, we go to the award banquet and we get our, our trophy, our little statue or our glass thing and we're kind of holding it. We get to say a few words. So we're like, hey, I just want to thank my teammates. I want to thank this great company. And last and most important, I just want to thank my God and Father in heaven because without him, none of this would be possible. And everybody claps. You know, like, yeah. And we sort of, we're pointing up to the sky. Our, 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 our spouses are so proud of us for acknowledging the Lord. Right? This, this is what we want. People will clap. They'll be proud of us. We want God to get the glory. We just want, don't want him to leverage our weakness. We want him to leverage our talent and our strength. We'll be quick to give him the glory for the good things. And like you, uh, I'm like this too. When a famous person uh, gives God the glory, I love that. Don't you? I actually want to be one of those guys. Right? God, God, just shine the light on me. Make me famous. And when you do that, I'll be sure to go. Right? This is, this is what we want. And God does that sometimes. And sometimes God says, no. I'm not going to leverage your success. And I'm not going to leverage the skill I've given you or the opportunity. I'm not going to leverage the great discipline that you have taken and added to the talent I've given you and, and maximized it even more. In this case, what I'm going to leverage is your weakness. I'm going to leverage your inability. I'm going to leverage your lack 
of opportunity. I'm going to leverage what some people, when they look at you, consider to be failure. I'm going to get glory from you, but I'm going to do it from the stage of your weakness, not your strength. Now, the good news here is we don't get to choose. Because none of us would choose the weak part, right? We don't get to choose this. But let me ask you this. Isn't it true, especially if you're a Christian, that when you meet another Christian who has a life circumstance that makes you shudder, when you walk away, you're like, God, thank you so much, that's not me. Because I don't know how I'd manage that. I don't know how I could cope with that. I don't know how I could deal with that boss or that job or that marriage or that whatever. But when you scratch beneath the surface, you find that these people have a peace. You find that for them, this thing that seems horrible to you is something that, that they don't even think is all that bad. And, and, and it doesn't make any sense. And so you dig a bit deeper and you push them and, and, and you push them. And finally, you hear words that sound something like this. They say, well, I don't know, but his grace is sufficient for me. And somehow, God has chosen not to make me strong, but to showcase his strength on the stage of my weakness. And aren't those some of the most impressive Christians that you and I have ever met? Not the ones who God has given everything to, but the ones who seem to have nothing but have more Jesus than all the rest of us put together. Now, I'm all for the guy in the end zone or the guy trotting around third or the guy who's at the Oscars kind of pointing in the air. I love that. I love when anyone gives God glory. I, I love this. But the ones who really move you and the ones who really move me, the ones who supercharge our faith and take it to a whole new level, aren't the ones who are successful and talented, but the ones who God showcases his strength through their weakness. Aren't these the people who, who make you scratch your head and say, there has to be a God? I mean, how else is, is this even possible? There's no other explanation. So, so here's a heads up if this is in your future, or here's an explanation if this has been in your past, or, or here's some comfort if this is part of your current reality. God will, God has, God is going to showcase his strength in your weakness and in my weakness if we will learn to take no for an answer. And it has nothing to do with his love for you. And it has nothing to do with his compassion toward you. It has nothing to do with his presence in your life. In fact, don't miss this. His strength in your weakness is his presence in your life. God's strength in your weakness is God's presence in your life. And then God, uh, Paul goes on to say this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Weaknesses? But, but Paul, you're, you're Paul. I mean, look at all the great things you've done. Look at all the amazing things you've done. And, and, and Paul says, yeah, yeah, I've had some successes, but you know what? I think God gets to show off best, not in my strength, but in my weakness. And he continues on and says, so that Christ's power may rest, may dwell, make, may take up residence in or on me. And then he continues, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. Really? I mean, does anyone else think this guy might be lying? Who delights in weakness? Do you think maybe he's just making it up? Who would say this? But, but watch what he says. In insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And the passage ends like this. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Have you ever met anybody like this? Aren't they just the most impressive, unbelievable take your breath away followers of Jesus you've ever met. Sometimes God says no. But when he says no, he also says yes. I'm not going to change your circumstances. No, I'm not going to fix that. No, I'm not going to interrupt the laws of nature and do something miraculous or change somebody's mind. But in the meantime, while you wait and while you pray, 
while, while I work in somebody a different way or through someone else, my grace is sufficient for you. So here's the deal. I'm going to give you five things real quick, and then I'm going to tell you a story, and we're going to end. Okay? I know. You're like, five more things? Quick, I promise. Number one, we have permission to ask God to remove the thorns in our lives. Isn't this good news? This is good. We, whatever it is, whatever it is for you, the thing you're struggling with, the thing that's got you, you have permission, like Paul, to ask God to remove the thorns in your life. And, and it's not a lack of faith to ask him. And it's not a lack of faith to continually ask him. You, you can totally do this. Whatever and whoever that thorn may be. Here's number two. God has permission to say no. Just like Paul, you have permission to ask, but God has permission to say no. God has permission to let his plan trump your plan. Okay? Amen? <laughs> About a third of you. Okay, good. Um, number three, God may choose to showcase his power on the stage of our weakness. In other words, it may never change. Some things may never get better. Some things may never work out. Some things may never be healed. And some things may never come back together. And that is not a reflection of God's concern or lack of concern for you. It is his opportunity to showcase his strength in the midst of your weakness. Number four. You can't experience God's sustaining grace while resisting his will. You can't do it. You can't experience the sustaining grace of God um, while resisting his will. Uh, just a minute longer on this one. This is the rub for us, isn't it? Uh, there, there's a word that's used a lot of times in Christian circles. Um, the word is, is striving. And, and when we are striving with God... It, what it means is it's just being so intensely frustrated because God won't answer my prayers. Has anyone else ever felt like that? Right? And, and what ends up happening is we, we kind of take this mental attitude. I'm not going back to that stupid church. And I'm not listening to any more of those stupid worship songs. I mean, they're full of lies anyway. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm not even opening my Bible. And so we shut God out, and, and, and as we do that, all we are doing is thinking about God, right? You, you, you've tried to shut him out, but, but you continually think about him. We say we're going to shut him out, and then all we do is we have these imaginary conversations with God. And then God whispers back to us, and he goes, you, you know that's praying, right? And we're like, no, it's not. It's an imaginary conversation, God, because I am not talking to you. Right? This is how this, this plays out. And, and, and so, so we say this, and God says, well, I'm sorry, but that's a prayer. We say, well, I'm not praying. And God says, well, then, you know what? Just, just don't think about me. Oh, I can't not think about you, but, but God, I'm so mad at you. And God says, well, then at least I have your attention. See, this is called striving. Everyone in this room has done this, right? We've all done this. We've all been in, in a mode of striving. But we can't quit believing. We've seen too much. Think about the past and what God has done in our lives and how we've seen him show up in the lives of others. You can't abandon your faith even though you try. And, and, and you try, right? You try to walk away. You try to leave him. But when you come back, when you come back, um, all of a sudden, what happens? One of your kids, one of your kids turns on Christian radio and you listen for a little while and then one of the songs says something that's the total opposite of what you've been experiencing, and you're just filled with so much anger and angst. It's just driving you nuts, and you're like, God, why won't you? And if you're there, you would. And this is called striving. And you will never experience his strength in your weakness. You will never experience sustaining grace as long as you are striving against his will, even if it's just a short-term will. You'll just be mad. You'll just be bitter. And you know what? You'll still be a Christian. You'll still be a believer. You can't get away from it, but you won't benefit from it. So at some point, and if I were to dip into your circumstance, if I were to hear your story, you know what? I, I wouldn't tell you, you know what? Just have faith. You'll be good. I never say stuff like that. 
Because I've seen enough and I've lived enough to know that if I were in your story I, and I heard your story, I'd say, God, I'd feel the same way. I, I, I'd be mad at you too. So there's no condemnation in this. It's just that you'll never experience the grace of God in your weakness as long as you are resisting and striving and refusing to take God's no for an answer. Here's the last one. Sustaining grace begins with not my will, but your will be done. Sustaining grace begins with this prayer that we see our Savior pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he said a reflection of what the Apostle Paul said, I, I don't want to have to drink from this cup, the cup of death, the, the cup of crucifixion. Here's what I want, Jesus says. Here's what I don't want. Here's what I'd like you to do differently. Not, but at the end of it, God, not my will, not what I want, but your will be done. And into this gap between, between what we want God to do and what he's going to do. Into this gap between what we feel like we deserve and we've earned and God owes us and what he seems to be doing for everyone else and what he's actually going to do or not going to do for me is his sufficient, sustaining, empowering grace. The very power of God but you'll never experience it. And I'll never experience it as long as we are striving and resisting and arguing. It begins. It begins when we kind of go, oh, God, if this is what you want for me, not my will, but your will be done. I'm trusting you for your strength and power to do the things that I can't do. And the reason I can look at you guys, I can look every one of you in the eye and say that this is true today is not because of a verse, and it's not because of my experience, but it's because the people who have done the most for my faith are not the ones who got a bow on the end of their life and of their story. It's not the ones who got to tie a ribbon on it and stick a fork in it and say it's done and it's in the past. It's the ones who every single day, sometimes every single hour, when they were in the midst of it, even at their lowest point, knowing it may never change, they could say, God's grace is sufficient for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. In my weakness, he is strong. And he's there. I'm going to have the band come back. I just want to get real personal for a minute. Um, a lot of you guys have heard Bethany and I's story. You've heard about our marriage. For the first 10 years we were married, I'd have told anybody in the world we had the best marriage on the planet. And, and in part, that was just because my wife hadn't told me any different at that point. <laughs> and, and years 10 to 15 were some of the, the most difficult um, we had to struggle through them years of our marriage. And if God's grace wasn't sufficient, I don't know that we would have made it through those years. But I tell you what, when I thought my marriage was perfect, um, God didn't do a whole lot through that. But it's been some of the brokenness that God has gotten us through that has given so many people hope and encouragement. His grace that was sufficient for us has ministered to so many more people. Um, when we first got married, I think my first job, I made $11,400 a year. Uh, it was the better part of a decade before I broke $20,000 a year in terms of income, and I was always the, the primary breadwinner. Um, so it's amazing we're not in worse place, financial condition than we are, I think. Um, uh, and, and, and so one of the things that I always took a lot of pride in was we our, our, over the years, we, we made good decisions, and our credit score kept climbing. We actually, until a couple of years ago, had insanely high credit scores. And then just sort of the cost of ministry and with a house we couldn't sell and some things we had to do there, um, <laughs> we, like, have no credit anymore. Um, and I hate that. I hate the fact that if something devastating were to happen and I were to have something break that costs like $2,000, I have no ability credit-wise to, to handle that anymore because of what's happened to us. So I went from this place of pride to this place of brokenness. And, and I'll tell you guys, if I let it get to me, if I think about it, um, it, it, it can feel like it's closing in and constricting. Anyone know what that feels like? Um, 
But if I trust God, his grace always seems to be sufficient. When I was a kid, I always loved that I was like the biggest kid. I was always the strongest kid for my age. Love that. I think I'm still like the, the biggest kid even in my late 30s. That's probably not a good thing, right, Jeremy? Um, and, uh, and so I've always loved that. But guess what? You know, I, I have two arthritic knees. I got some x-rays done this week. I actually have arthritis in my right hip, which explains why I felt pain in this hip every single day for the last year. Um, and, and it's sort of taken me out of doing a lot of the things that I would do. And there, there are some weeks where I'm sort of like, I'm like hobbling around this place. I, I think you have to actually hobble to be on staff here now. It's like part of the deal. Um, but but, but I, I, I seriously, I've I'm, I'm experienced this pain in my body. But, but let me say it this way, guys. Seriously, when, when everything is perfect and God gives us everything we ask for, do we really trust him? Do we really rely on him? Do we really get to know him? Or is it in our weakness? Is it in our need that we really get to know God in a deeper way? So I want to just say to you today, because when I look out and I see some of the things you guys are living through right now, some of the things you guys are struggling through, it gives me unbelievable faith to know that his grace is sufficient. I hope and pray when you guys look at me and you see some of the things that, that I'm living through, it gives some of you hope to know that his grace is sufficient. And it's not easy, and it's not what we want, and it's not the script that we would write, but when we allow him, when we see what Jesus says, and, and it starts to come true in the lives of, of all of us, it's a powerful thing, right? Right? When he says this, look at the text. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So what if God shows up primarily not in the great things, but he shows up powerfully in our weakness and in our brokenness? Consider these words today.
pray for you. God, today, we just confess we know what it feels like when you're uncooperative, when it doesn't seem like you're there. God, we know the, the pain of, of that absence and that loneliness. And yet, God, today, I just pray that you would fill us with, with energy and excitement and hope and faith to know that, that God, you are never not there. God, you, you always hear us. You are always there. And if we allow you, God, you give us the grace to survive anything and everything. So God, whether it's the man or the woman or the student or the broken relationship or the horrible work environment, God, whatever that thing is for us today, I pray that, that you would help us to trust you, to stop striving and stop trying to figure it out ourselves. But God, may we just allow you to flood that situation and that circumstance with your grace. And we will thank you for our ability to survive and our ability to see and, and experience life even in the midst of what seemed like crushing circumstance. So God, help us to have faith and to live differently even when it seems like you're uncooperative. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And church, as you go from this place today, remember that God's grace is sufficient for you in any and every circumstance of your life in his power. His incredible, limitless power is made perfect in your weakness and my weakness. Let's go from this place today letting people see the power of God in and through our lives. It's great to have you guys here today.